Okay, so good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, tonight we're going to be <clears throat> covering the second uh, uh, part of this four-part series in which we've been looking at um, Jewish theology in modern times. Uh, and this series, as you know, we've seen so far, is uh, you know inspired by the um, the teachings of the late Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, a blessed memory. Um, but it's not limited to him, but really, I would say, kind of inspired by the the direction, by the 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 vision that he had for a uh, for a holistic um, Jewish theology that worked in concert with modern sensibilities, um, and how he really has created for us and left to us. Um, bless him, you know, he, he's left to us a, 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 uh, a great legacy, a, 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 a basis upon which uh, Jewish thought, I think, can continue for, for a very long time uh, into the future in a way which, which really is in, works in, re which resonates with, with, the, modern, uh, with the modern mind. Um, and, and in a sense, I've, I've heard this from other people, you know, he's like, for some people, he's like saved orthodoxy. You know, he's, he's shown how uh, orthodoxy, how traditional Jewish thought and practice actually can live in harmony with uh, Western thinking and the Western world. Uh, and so he very much has done for us what Rambam did probably for Sephardic Jewry in the 12th mm. century. Um, and that is uh, something uh, remarkable and significant. And, and you, know, you know, it's hard to compare anybody to Rambam, you know, but in the sense that Rambam's teaching continued to inspire us you know, a millennia later, I think some of the things that Rabbi Sachs was able to articulate will, will be around for a very long time as well. And so what I'd like, what I hope is that as a result of this series, we'll be able to articulate some of those lasting messages or lasting ideas that, um, that uh, Rabbi Sachs was able to um, articulate and to understand uh, kind of where he took traditional thought and, and shall we say, moved it forward in line, in, in, inspired by a tradition of thinking, perhaps a particular slice of the tradition, um, but really showed how to give it language and to give it meat or kind of for, for how it can be meaningful to us. And we, we, we owe him a, uh, a debt of gratitude that we will never be able to, to truly fulfill. So I'm just gonna mute everyone for this. I'll, at a certain points, I'll pause. If people have questions or comments, then we can, uh, people can unmute themselves at that time, but this way we just don't get feedback uh, from it. So tonight's, uh, series is going to be focusing on probably the most challenging of, of all of the subjects, and that's struggling with tragedy and evil. Uh, this is, you know, one of those questions which, uh, you know, you have to be brave to wade, wade into. And so uh, I, I'm not that brave. I'm just going to quote what other people have said. So it's, a, uh, it, it's obviously a very challenging um, topic. Um, but obviously one which is, uh, you know, hugely, hugely important um, and one which I hope will be uh, um, helpful to, uh, to all of us. So I'm going to start by, um, by, here, I'm just going to play this. I'm going to start by uh, looking at the following. This is over here. This is, I would say, the classic approach to the question, right? I'll just go back for a second. The classic approach to the question of, why do bad things happen to good people, right? Because that's the question that people struggle with, right? About how exactly does this work in practice, right? This, this feeling of, you know, why are bad things happening? Why do people suffer? You know, how do we make sense of this world? You know, people who live very good lives and bad things happen to them. Um, and then, you know, you have people who, who are, you know, not good, and yet seem to live very good lives. And kind of, how does that fit, you know, with 
the ethos of the Torah that seems to say, you know, God, that, 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 or, or shall we say, uh, just fundamentally, our sense of justice, you know, that if someone has a good life, that they should, that they should, you know, have good, you know, and even kind of going beyond that, even if someone maybe doesn't live the best of lives, but, you know, where's, where's mercy, you know, why should anybody really suffer, you know, how is that, how is that fair, how is that kind of work with the notion of a, of a good and a just, uh, you know, God. Um, and so that's kind of a, a question which, you know, I think we really struggle with today, uh, but it's nothing new. I mean, people have struggled with this question for a very long time. And so one of the sources that I'd like to look at with all of you is the, um, is the, the source um, from the Talmud, which, um, is kind of a classic Jewish approach and has very much driven uh, many Jewish thinkers throughout the millennia, you know, even until this day. And so if you want to understand the approach that I would say is kind of dominant or has been dominant in Jewish thinking, or at least in what people I think perceive to be dominant Jewish thinking, uh, this source uh, says it all. So let's take a look at this. This is from the Talmud. And it says the following. It says, uh, and I'll just read it in English. It says, Rabbi Eliezer said in the name of Rabbi Tzadok, to what are the righteous in this world compared? He answered, to a tree that stands entirely in a place of purity and its branches stretch to a place of impurity. So this is based on the halakha that things are impure if they grow in an impure soil. The question is, what if they, their branches, and if they're in holy soil, then that thing is considered to be holy. Question is, what if the branches stretch over into a different uh, area? Does that make a difference? So he says, if its branches are cut, it stands entirely in a place of purity. I mean, there's no question, right? If the branches are cut, then the tree is completely in a state of purity and you don't have to worry. So he says, so does the Holy One, blessed be he. He brings suffering to the righteous in this world in order that they inherit the world to come. As it says in Job, and through your beginning, and though your beginning had great suffering and your end great will increase greatly, right? And so this idea that why do the righteous suffer? Well, the righteous suffer in this world so that in the world to come, the olam ha'emet, the true world, they will only have reward, right? They will only have good. There's no person in the world that doesn't sin a bit. And so if the righteous uh, were not, in a sense, punished in this world, the world to come would be a mixture of punishment and reward. So they're punished a bit in this world so that the world to come, things will just be smooth sailing. And then he says, to what are the wicked in this world compared? And he flips it. And he essentially says that it's the opposite, right? That in, the, uh, in you know, this world, the, the, the wicked prosper so that when they get to the world to come, they have no prosperity. There's no prosperity left for them to uh, receive reward from, and they only will receive punishment in the world to come. So this uh, is, a, uh, is a very kind of stark uh, um, way of thinking about things, um, and it relies on several uh, principles. Uh, so maybe I'll just open up. What, what would those of you who are philosophers in the room say, what are the, um, the underpinnings of this teaching? Right, any, any kind of, what, it, what, is, what are the assumptions that this source is making, and it's making a number of assumptions. But isn't this very close yeah. to a Christian way of thinking? No. Care to elaborate, David? Please, let's just take one at a well, time. Well, this uh, this is uh, that you know we're not here um, in this world. That the, the Christian way of thinking is always thinking about going forward and the next world, and they'll suffer in this world, but in the world to come then uh, they will they, they will in a similar way to has been writ written here they will have uh, redemption and a and a wonderful life so that to me sounds very very similar to a christian theologian's here 
Okay. I've, well, I think, that's, feel... I think that's an interesting point, David. And, and, and I, obviously, I, I hear that from people a lot, um, this idea of almost that um, somehow that, I don't know if, if what you're saying is exactly this, but that somehow Judaism doesn't believe in a, in a world after um, or in a heaven or a hell. Um, and I'm not sure where that, um, where that attitude comes from. The Jews don't believe in that because Jewish sources are full of belief mm -hmm. in the world to come. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's correct to say that that is a, uh, a, a Christian idea. Um, but obviously well, they may have taken it from us. Right. Entirely. Yeah. Right. And, yeah, right. I mean, it, obviously it's, 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 it's an idea that many different faith groups have, right? That there is a world beyond this. And obviously what it seems is that one of the reasons, you know, obviously there's, there's a tradition of this based on biblical sources, but obviously it helps answer the question because you can kind of push it off, right? And say, right, things don't make sense here, but that's because there's a world where things will make sense, right? So, right. So I would say one, obviously clear, um, uh, um, uh, shall we say, principle that this source relies on is the idea that there is a world to come. Fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Right. That's that. What, what, what's another, what other assumptions is, does this source uh, make? Um, Flora has her hand up. Yes. Well, I, I, I agree with the previous speaker. I think this something, not the assumption, it's something very well known that we, cannot get it we may not we may never receive a reward in this world we may seeming well first of all there are two things flora flora i just want to tell you i'm just, I just want right now right just assumptions that this source is i just want to analyze this text uh, the assumption is that you don't necessarily have an easy time in this world and you know and you and the fact that you may be so-called punished does not mean that you are a wicked person it means it can mean that you're a sadiq why do the righteous suffer? Maybe because you, you suffer because you're a sadiq, and therefore you can have your portion in the world to come. So what? So, again, the real. So, so let's just take the. So what are the assumptions that this source is making? I'm just going to push everyone. There's okay. no reward here in this. There may not be a reward in this world. No, that, that's what this says. Easiness. That's what the source says. But what are the yes. assumptions the source is the making? Does anyone have anything they? Uh, an assumption is that the. Yeah. Um, world to come is very very important here because uh just by the premise of the extreme suffering some so-called righteous people would have um it shows that you know the kind of degree that they're going through in this life and it's assuming that there is the world to come and this world to come is very important fine so paul i take that again this definitely assumes that there's a world to come that's one assumption the source is making. Let's get another one. Silvano has his hand up. Silvano, you got to unmute though, please. Okay, no, my assumption, what I was saying is that I concentrate on the branches, at least my attention was concentrate on the plant and the branches. So we are not, as humans, we are not 100% good or 100% evil there is the evil side that can be cut and that's when we suffer okay thank you Silvana. thank you thank you so let's so so does anyone else want to add something i see jeffrey has his hand up can you unmute yourself jeff the assumption is that the rabbis know and can we assume that they do know must we assume they do know maybe they don't know i'm not sure if that's an assumption they're they're stating that they know or this particular rabbi is stating that he knows let, let me let, let me um thank you jeffrey i appreciate it. let me let me let me say a couple things essentially it's making a couple assumptions right the one assumption it's making is that there is reward and punishment right meaning that's an assumption it's making it, it's making an assumption that each of us gets what we deserve Right? I mean, that's like a fundamental assumption the source is making that it therefore then has to respond and say, but that's not what we see around us, right? Meaning we assume that there is reward and punishment and we assume that God is just and therefore what we see doesn't make sense. So it answers it with the world to come, right? And, it's some, and it accepts that that's an answer, meaning that it's like fair that the righteous are suffering 
because, well, they're gonna get the reward in the world to come, so it's okay that they're suffering. I mean, it's making a lot of assumptions um, and, 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 it, and it has, I would say, a, a worldview that, that sees that. And I think one of the principles that the source is stating, right, is an idea that what happens to us is coming to us, right? That what happens to a person is divinely ordained, right? That's a, a, an assumption that it's making, meaning it's like if somebody is suffering, they must be that they are meant to suffer, okay? It's assuming, right, that there is this very particular kind of uh, system that's in place and that everything that we experience is what we are meant to experience. Um, this is the classic Jewish view. I mean, to kind of take it to its extreme, you find that this is, this position is articulated you know, to the extent of saying that a leaf does not fall from a tree unless God wills that leaf to fall and where it lands was also predetermined or ordained by God that that leaf should land in that particular spot, right? Meaning basically saying that everything that happens is the will of God. If it's all the will of God, then we have to understand why is that person suffering? Oh, that person is suffering because God is a reason for making that person suffer. But ultimately, you know, don't worry, everything uh, works out the way that it's, uh, that's best, the way that it's meant to. So there's a, a deep sense of like faith, right? That, that everything ultimately, uh, ultimately makes sense. So that's a classic view. You find that in many classic sources. Um, you find that even in some contemporary writings, meaning it's really kind of classic view. Um, Post-Holocaust, this attitude for many people becomes, became just like completely untenable. You know, just like, like no way to at all justify this, for this to resonate as, as, as rational, as plausible. I mean, it, it ultimately came across it like, saying that everything that happens is like meant to happen and has a purpose and has a function became not only like implausible for many people became like cruel, like, like in, almost insane that you're going to tell me every single person that was murdered in the Holocaust, they were meant to be murdered. And that's what God wanted. God wanted a million and a half children to be, to be slaughtered by the Nazis in front of their parents. Like that's God, you know, that's be, you know, and, and to tell me, don't worry in the world to come, everything is great. Just became almost like so unbearable, so untenable to make that argument that there was this movement away from this line of thinking, right? For, to, to just say like, to think about the world that way. I mean, like, that's, that, that's like, you know, I don't know if this is the right word, that, that, that's Goldilocks. I mean, you're, you're living in some fantasy, you know, where like you are just like completely out of touch with reality, with human experience, with what actually goes on in this world. You know, and to say that every person, you know, that suffers was meant to suffer and everyone that gets cancer is meant to get can I mean, it's just like, you know, you can believe that if you want to, but like you're essentially like creating a, a, a false sense of reality to like give you a sense that, that your world makes sense. But like, if you just like analyze that for a second, there is no resonance with, with what we actually experience in this world for that worldview to stand up. Now, I'll say what I said in the last lecture. If that's what you believe, go ahead. I'm not, I'm not telling you not to believe that. But what I'm gonna show you is that thinkers in the past 75 years, you know, traditional Jewish thinkers who are kind of really thinking about these issues seem to have kind of um, adjusted the way that they think about some of these sources and have in a sense, I would say relied on other sources, right? And really turned away from what seems to be kind of this, I don't know, nice idea, wishful thinking philosophy 
that just simply doesn't seem to fit with you know their um, you know their experience of of you know of the of the world um, certainly in a post Holocaust era. So you really see a lot of this coming after the Holocaust. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you a video from Rabbi Sachs. Okay, so this is a uh, part of a series that uh, the Rabbi Sachs uh, uh, did. Um, dealing with kind of some major questions, some major questions, okay? So I'm gonna pull up my screen again, um, and I'm gonna show you a YouTube video. Okay. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so this was the question that was asked. How did the Holocaust affect my personal faith? Well, firstly, it hugely strengthened my Jewish identity because I just felt the weight of all these ghosts. And I knew that what they died for, I had to live for. I could not let their Jewish story end with me. I just couldn't. But it did completely transform my understanding of faith. And here I want to speak about a midrash, a rabbinic exegesis, which dates from, whoa, fourth, fifth century. And it's commentary on Abraham leaving his land, his home, his father's house. And the midrash was very enigmatic, says the following. What was the matter like? It was like a traveler who is going through a desert and sees a palace in flames. And he says, is it possible that the palace has no owner? Just then the owner of the palace appeared over the parapet and said, I am the owner of the palace. Now that's a very enigmatic midrash. But once I had been to Auschwitz, I really understood what it meant. And it is a rather dramatic thing. Abraham saw the universe, it's a palace. This vast universe, this vast law abiding universe, the laws of chemi chemistry, physics, you name it. It's a, it's a universe that is pretty predictable for the most part and obeys its laws. It's a palace. Somebody made it, it, it has design. But it's in flame. I see a world full of violence, war, injustice, exploitation, cruelty. Now somebody builds a palace, doesn't leave it to the flames. You try and put the flames out. So how can I understand that on the one hand, the universe is a palace and on the other hand, people are ruining it and killing one another. And that's when God appears to Abraham and says, I'm the owner of the palace. I need you to help me put out the flames. I need you to help me put out the flames. God who made the entire universe can't put out the flames of violence and injustice. Yes, there is only one thing God cannot do without help from us. And that is live within the human heart. And that is what God was calling on Abraham to do. I need you to help me put out the flames because I cannot do it myself without destroying this very thing I created. The only thing I created in my image, human beings with freedom of will. I can't take that away without taking everything human away. I would turn humanity into a bunch of 7 billion robots programmed to sing my praises all day long. I'm sorry, that's not what I created in human beings. And I suddenly realized that that is what makes Jewish faith very unusual. Most faith is born in a simple, consistent view of the universe. Judaism is born in cognitive dissonance. 
On the one hand, we believe in a God of justice. On the other hand, we see a world full of injustice. And it was not the people at the fringes, the disbelievers, the atheists who raised this challenge. It was the heroes of faith themselves. Abraham said, shall the judge of all the earth not do justice? Moses said, why have you done evil to this people? Jeremiah said, you always win when I argue with you about justice, but still I want to know why do the wicked prosper? Job is an entire book dedicated to it. But when you find that cognitive dissonance between the world that is and the world that ought to be, there's only one way of solving it. And that's not by thought, it's by deed. You have to help God put out the flames. And that is, to me, what faith is all about. I suddenly realized faith is not some passive thing that happens to you. It's an active thing that gets you to engage in the world and fight injustice and ignorance and disease and poverty, because that is what God is asking us for. We have to act. Faith is something we do, not just something we believe. Okay. So uh, absolutely powerful. I mean, I, I get chills listening to Rabbi Sachs and every time I, I watch him, I, I feel the weight of his loss. Rabbi Sachs is saying something here, which is uh, incredibly important. He, he's saying here, why do bad things happen to good people? Right? The Holocaust. Right, why do bad things happen to good people? because the palace is in flames, because we are in an imperfect world. We're in a world where people do bad things. We're in a world that has disease. And why do bad things happen? Not because they deserved it, not because there's some uh, scheme of between this world and that world, because that's what happens in this world. And we want the world to be better. We want the righteous to prosper. We want the world to function the way it is. Don't look to God. Look at yourself. That is how we create this perfect world. Um, and you see here a complete adjustment in the way that the world is understood. There is this sense that the palace is simply in flames. It's not a controlled fire. It's not a controlled burn that's you know, precise and, and done in a specific way. Uh, but this is the world that God created. God wanted to give us free will. He wanted to give us purpose. And to do that, he needed to let the world kind of run its course. Uh, and then it becomes incumbent on us on what we do with that world. And as I heard, you know, somebody say in questioning Rabbi Sachs, this may not be the most comforting message to tell somebody in, somebody in a hospital room. You know, when you're with a, a patient and you tell them, well, you know, bad things happen. You know, it's more comforting to say, no, this is for a reason. You know, there, there, there's a purpose to your suffering, you know, ultimate. And Rabbi Sachs is saying that's not, that the world, the world is not the way we'd like it to be. But what it does is it tells us that we have a role, meaning if God created us, then what God is also saying that we have the ability to perfect it, right? We have the ability to make it work better, but ultimately it's on us to figure that out. Now, that is a radical departure from that source that we started with. And so what I'd like to do with you is to understand where this attitude came from and to see how others in the years leading up to Rabbi Sachs began articulating some of these ideas. And then ultimately I'll close with another video of Rabbi Sachs where we see that he takes it even further, even further, which I think is, uh, is really important. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up Again, the, uh, the, uh, the sheet that I have. And we'll take a look at, uh, at I think, the source 
that really kind of is some of the uh, the underpinnings, perhaps, for some of these uh, some of these ideas. And so we're going to go back here. This next source is with again Gersonides. We uh, we saw him last time uh, as 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 a uh, kind of again in the Maimonidean uh, school of thought, um, and we'll see again a quite rat what might seem to some as a radical uh, approach. And so this is what uh, uh, Gersani Jabilevi ben Gershom uh, wrote, and he says the following: He says, if we posit that he, that he, meaning God, does extend his providence to human individuals, it would follow that we may attribute injustice to God on account of the imperfect order of events in matters of good and evil accruing to men, since it often occurs that the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. And so uh, Gersonides here says quite clearly that if we say hashkacha pratit, that there is, you know, divine providence, then you have no choice but to say God is unjust. And he says, what he in essence is saying is since we do not accept the fact that God is unjust, we must therefore say there is no hashkacha pratit, there is no uh, individual divine providence. Uh, and so he makes this point very clearly that that is not how we see the world. We do not see the world as, you know, everything lines up, you know, A equals, you know, one plus one equals two. That's not the way that things ultimately uh, function. He's obviously an important uh, medieval Jewish thinker. And uh, whether or not uh, some of these other thinkers we're going to look at were relying specifically on him, I'm not sure. But I certainly want to just show that there is a um, earlier sources for some of these ideas. Of course, Rabbi Sachs himself quoted the Midrash with his palace and flames metaphor as uh, a basis for his thinking. But among the medieval philosophers, you find um, this attitude uh, as well. If you say this attitude to some other Jews nowadays, they'll call you a heretic. But this is the source right there. It's, it's, it's very clear. This is, a, this is a, an accepted uh, position uh, uh, among other positions. Again, there were other medieval thinkers who believed in Hashkacha Pratit, but there, there were those who, um, who rejected it um, along the kinds of thinking that we just said. Um, and I'm going to show you that there were several other thinkers uh, in the years leading up to Rabbi Sachs that also uh, embraced this type of attitude that said, we shouldn't search for justice in God. We need to find justice through man, right? And God created us with that ability. And that ultimately, if we find injustice or, imp or if we find imperfection in the world, ultimately it means that mankind hasn't done enough because that ultimately God has given us the abilities to make the world better. And if it's not better yet, we shouldn't blame God, we should be blaming ourselves. And so I'm gonna show you uh, a quote from Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, and also from the Lubavitcher Rebbe that seem to say uh, both of these ideas. So this is both from a very a rationalist and a Hasidic, where we'll see that the, a similar kind of uh, approach, though both of them were Lithuanian. So, you know, maybe it's part of the, uh, the uh, Lithuanian Jewish tradition as well. So let's take a look over here. So this is from Rabbi Soloveitchik's uh, very important work, uh, The Lonely Man of Faith. Uh, it's a very important work. If you haven't read it, it's, it's not long. It's very hard to read, uh, but I would recommend uh, that you read it. It's, uh, it's a very, uh, one of the few things that he, that he wrote. Um, there's been a lot published after his death based on his teachings, but it's, it's one of the few books that he himself wrote. So he writes the following. He says, only when man rises to the heights of freedom of action and creativity of mind, does he begin to implement the mandate of, de of dignified responsibility entrusted to him by his maker, right? Meaning only when man becomes creative does one earn 
in a sense, the responsibility that his maker, that God has entrusted to him. And then he gives examples. He says, man of old who could not fight disease and succumbed in multitudes to yellow fever or any other plague with degrading helplessness could not lay claim to dignity. Only the man who built hospitals, discovers therapeutic techniques, and saves lives is blessed with dignity. And so what Rabbi Soloveitchik is saying is that God has given us the abilities to fight disease, and that ultimately we earn dignity, right? We, we earn the fulfillment of who we are as God's creations with free will when we do that. And to be honest, I think you only have to look at the events of this past year to see that. I mean, if this plague had happened a century ago, even 50 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago, how many people would have died this year? I mean, way too many people died. A lot of people died this year and it's awful. But imagine how many would have died around the world from COVID, you know, 100 years ago. It's hard, it's, hard, it's, it's hard to even fathom what that, what that would have been, right? But because of, you know, scientific ability, our understanding of how, how disease spreads, you know, our ability to, to organize, the fact that we have internet that allowed us to communicate with each other, even in, meaning the world was maybe at a point where we were able to kind of not allow a plague to affect us the way it affected people in history, because of it. And there's a level of dignity that comes from that. And so, you know, what Rabbi Soloveitchik would say is that, you know, the things happen in the world. God has enabled us to overcome those things. It's about us finding the ability to do that. Um, and therein lies ultimately kind of dignity. And you kind of see that idea of the purpose of man lies in our ability to overcome challenges, not in our reliance that God will overcome those challenges for us, or that in some future, you know, plane of existence, you know, all will be well, and that our suffering in this world, you know, was there uh, in, with, you know, divine uh, intention. So that's Rabbi Soloveitchik. Let me show you um, Lubavitch Rebbe, because he also says a similar idea, which I think we should take a look at. So here Lubavitch Rebbe says, this is a, a letter that he wrote in 1984 in a uh, book about, about uh, loss um, called The Time to Heal. And so someone kind of collected some of his writings and wrote the following. He says, he writes to this fellow, he says, why did God permit the Holocaust? The only answer we can give is only God knows. So there's no explanation here. There's no, def you know, defending. God knows, we, we, we don't know. However, the very fact that there is no answer to this question is in of itself proof that one is not required to know the answer or understand it in order to fulfill one's purpose in life. Despite the lack of satisfactory answer to the awesome and tremendous why, one can and must carry on a meaningful and productive life, promote justice and kindness in one's surroundings, and indeed help create a world where there should be no room for any Holocaust for any kind of man's inhumanity to man. And so here, Lubavitch Rebbe is saying something slightly different, though still saying this idea that it's ultimately on man to ensure that inhumanity does not exist. And what's interesting is he says over here, and this is like an interesting idea, and we'll, we'll kind of see this idea taken a bit further with Rabbi Sachs in, 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 the, in the video we're gonna, we're gonna go to later, is that there's somehow this notion, what he says is we don't need to know why, because not knowing why doesn't impede us. We can, without knowing why the Holocaust happened, we can still work to make sure another Holocaust doesn't happen. And therefore, on some level, he says it doesn't matter why, meaning we don't know, we don't know. But the fact that we don't know must mean that God doesn't, want, doesn't think we need to know, right? And that we can still carry on. And that again, you see this, this focus on, 
not making some theological sense of things, but a focus on what can we do about it, right? How do we ensure that this doesn't happen? How can we live a meaningful life? How can we serve God? How can we do good uh, in this world, right? That is what a person's focus should be. It shouldn't be why, it should be what do we do with this? How do we move forward? You know, and as some people said, we give meaning to things by the way we react to them. You know, it doesn't explain why the Holocaust happened, but if we can ensure another one doesn't happen, then we've done something meaningful with that experience, at least. We've given meaning to it, right? That ultimately our focus has to always be on what can I do, right? What can we do to make things better? So again, you see this idea repeated again, you know, among a very influential, you know, rabbi post Holocaust saying, let's just focus on what we can do. You know, that's where our attention ultimately uh, should be. And I'm just going to show one other source that I think is, again, maybe like indicating this approach from the Torah. And this is what I was saying earlier. We find this in this week's Pirasha. We find this in this past week's Torah reading. It says towards the end of Kitisa, where Moshe asks God, Har'eni na et kibodecha. God, let me behold your glory, your presence, which some explain is him saying to God, God, let me understand your ways, right? Show me how the world functions. And some have explained that he was saying to God, why do the evil prosper? Why do the righteous suffer, right? That's what he was saying to God, make sense of it. And God responded, Lo otet panai, ki lo adam he said, you cannot see my face, for man may not see me and live. And there's somewhere perhaps in this cryptic response, this idea that A, we are not meant to understand, and that somehow understanding like undermines our ability to be mankind because our purpose is to improve the world, okay? Give some thought to that, hold that in your mind. We're gonna go back and, and look at one other um, clip from uh, Rabbi Sachs um, that I think is picking up on this idea and taking it a bit further. And then we'll kind of unpack um, the different things that we've, uh, that, we've, that we've seen over here. So I'm gonna open up, uh, YouTube again. I'm going to switch to a different video. And let's take a look at, uh, let's take a look at this video over here. Okay. So this was uh, from a, a Q and A that, Ra that Rabbi Sachs did over Zoom. So I imagine this is, I think from the past year, to be honest, this, uh, this video. I started off telling you about my parents and it just comes to mind. I remember my father said to us that the last time he saw you, you remembered my mother had asked you a question, why do bad things happen to good people? And you said to my father, tell your wife, oh. wife I still don't have an answer for her. I was wondering if you had any more insight. <laughs> yes, I do actually. Oh. God does not want us to understand why bad things happen to good people. Because if we ever understood, we would be forced to accept that bad things happen to good people. And God does not want us to accept those bad things. He wants us not to understand so that we will fight against the bad and the injustices of this world. And that is why there is no answer to that question because God has arranged that we shall never have an answer to it. So 
let's uh, let's pull back. I mean, I, it's an absolutely powerful um, message that he gives over there, right? And just to to summarize, you know, he says, not we don't know. God doesn't want us to know why bad things happen. Because if we knew why bad things happened, then we'd say, well, it happened because of this reason, or it happened because of that reason, and we would just accept it. And he says, God doesn't want us to accept evil in this world. God wants us to fight against it. God wants us, right, in the words of Rabbi Soloveitchik, to cure diseases. You know, in the words of, of the Bab Rebbe, he wants us to make sure there never will be another Holocaust. Meaning that is what God ultimately wants of mankind is to put the flames out. And if we, in a sense, had a sense of why there were flames, we wouldn't bother. And that's not the purpose of humanity. That's not the purpose of our existence. Our purpose isn't to say, uh, don't worry, in the, in the world to come, things will be okay. No, <laughs> that's accepting it. Don't accept it. Listen, will things make sense in the world to come? Please God, they will. But that's not for this world. That's not for us to think about. That's not for us to worry about. If it provides a comfort to somebody who suffered a loss, fine. But ultimately, that's not for the living. For the living, it's for us to fight injustice, to fight against evil, right? And that's the reaction of why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know, and God doesn't want me to know. God wants us to work to make the world better. That's breathtaking. I mean, that is a profoundly inspiring, and I would say inspired uh, worldview. I mean, that is Rabbi Sachs taking, you know, medieval sources that perhaps reject you know, uh, divine providence. That's, you know, him drawing on the writings of Rabbi Soloveitchik and Lubavitch Rebbe, and maybe him drawing on that verse of lo yirani adam v'chai, if man sees me, he cannot live, meaning that God does not want us to see him. God does not want us to understand him. God wants us to fight. Uh, and, and that's really, I think, Rabbi Sachs taking, you know, these post-Holocaust rethinking of things and just pushing it a bit further, you know, of saying God wants us to improve the world. Ha, huh, that's a trick. Therefore, God doesn't want us to know why things happen because then where would be the impetus for us to make the world uh, into a better place? Uh, and I, and that's, I, I think that's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it, it's a... Uh, I know, again, I get the chills when I, when I listen to him. Um, but that's, I think, Rabbi, Rabbi Sachs really taking, you know, a, uh, a, a, a fresh and a 21st century kind of reflection on a classical question, on presenting an approach which is still in tune with classical Jewish sources, though clearly distancing from other classical Jewish sources, to present a worldview which is... Uh, I think, can sit more at peace with a modern mind that's unwilling to just accept, you know, that all these things that we see happen are predetermined or or are for a specific reason, um, but actually to say that, you know, the purpose is to in, in, empower us, to to inspire us, to, to, to improve the world, to better the world, to, to do good with our lives, and that when we see injustice, don't sit there and ponder why, there's no answer. God does, but not only is there no answer, God doesn't want us to know an answer because God wants us to act. God wants us to do. God wants us to make uh, the world into a better place. That is, a, uh, I think, a very modern and very fresh uh, approach, and I think uh, an attitude that, uh, will, uh, that suits the Jewish world well um, and I think inspires us a great deal. Um, I'm going to pause here and just you know, see if anyone has any questions, anything that they would like to... Uh, you know, to reflect back um, based on, on this teaching. But what I hope you've gained from this is, is seeing how Rabbi Sachs has done something different um, from class, some classical sources, but also to kind of see that he's part of a, a trend 
that was that that's been happening but just seeing how he kind of like pushed it a bit further how he just kind of like hmm, he, he he like he tied it up in a bow so that it like actually kind of all fits together um and i think presents a a a, a view which again up to you ultimately to take it or leave it but but that i think is is a um something that's that one can hold and carry forward okay yes jeff Please uh, unmute yourself. Rabbi, I've already spoken, so if there's somebody else that wants to speak, but I profoundly disagree. I know that Jews are allowed to disagree with the Almighty, but if one's allowed to disagree with Rabbi Sachs, Rabbi Soloveitchik, the Lubavitcher, and possibly even Rabbi Morris, I'm afraid I do, because I don't buy this at all. But we're, we're reaching the end, and maybe it's something we ought to do next week, I don't know. But if you want, I will just say a word or two. Well, what I will say, Jeff, and, and, and I appreciate you saying that, is as I started with, my goal is not to make anybody believe one thing or another. I'm, I'm simply uh, attempting to share an approach that's been, that's been kind of a, a modern Jewish approach. If it doesn't resonate with you, that's fine. That's well, okay. There, that's that's very, absolutely very briefly, all right. Very briefly, Rabbi all of you, all the rabbis are all universalist. And they look at the global world, a world where Jews are all over the world. In my view, the God of the Jewish people is a particular God, a tribal God, a God of, of the Torah, which is very much a God of his people. And I believe that the Almighty was not with his people in the Holocaust, but was very much with his people in the establishment of the return to the Jewish land. And my whole philosophy is based on that. That's enough. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Uh, Silvano. Uh, I, can I ask a... I'm oh, sorry. sorry. The thing that I find difficult to accept, if you excuse the repetition, is that acceptance means appeasance. In other words, if I... No, sorry. That understanding means appeasance. If I under why if I understand I should stop fighting it, this is the bit that I I have a problem with. I think what he's saying is that in a sense, if there's a reason why something bad has happened, so then there's like a divine reason for it. You know, either because oh this person needs to suffer in this world, so that in the world to come they only receive reward. So if there was like a reason why someone had to suffer for a purpose, then in a sense, why should you fight against it? It has a purpose. It has a function. I think that's his. I think that's his thinking. Mm. Yes, Flora. No, no, I'm just interested in what Jeffrey says because um, I, I, I think that um, you know, without reading the sources, the next thing I wanted to say to you was man's and humanity to man, and it's for us to put the world right. And I know this kitis. I was thinking about it coming up. To me, it's blatantly obvious. You know, we don't even need, I mean, I, I'm a believer and I, and I think what Rabbi Sachs, he was my teacher for six years, uh, it is very amazing and, and, and so radical in a sense, but not, it's not really because he's, the Rambam in his 13 principles of faith, he's saying that when he's talking about Hashem being an omniscient, you know, in other words, he's giving us free will. So if we've got free will, we're responsible, we're accountable. And this is how we can explain the Holocaust. I mean, I'm giving you a very simple explanation without, if I knew nothing, you know, and I don't know that much about uh, philosophy and theology, but that's how I always felt. It's man's and humanity to man. And Hashem hides his face because Hashem gives us free will and he wants us to put the world right. And I knew that beautiful, uh, very enigmatic, um, I've heard it from Rabbi Sachs many, many years ago, but you made it, you know, come even more alive. I, I really it gave it even more meaning. Thank you very much. But I, I don't understand. I, I know you're not here to change our mind, but I don't understand why Jeffrey has a problem with. Let's 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 not let's not get let's not get into uh, too much of a debate here, just because we don't have time. No, no, no. It. It's, it's, but, I'd like to. You know, but what I <laughs> but what I will say is, Flora, just in response to what you, what you were saying, is that Rabbi Sachs is going further because it's not just about things that man does. What about cancer? What about you know someone? you know, getting hit by a tsunami, right? So man doing it to man doesn't answer that, that question. So he's trying to like push it a little bit, um, a little bit beyond that, perhaps, perhaps. 
Does anybody else have any? Uh, Flor, I would like just uh, pause that and see if anybody else has anything else they'd like to add, just because we're going to have to end in a couple minutes. So thank, thank you, Flora, for your, for your comments. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to uh, reflect back? Okay, great. All right, well, uh, thank you all for, for joining tonight. Uh, a real pleasure uh, studying uh, with you. And uh, I hope that uh, everybody uh, learned something, uh, whether or not uh, personally meaningful or not, that's, that's, that's quite all right. Um, next week, we're going to kind of uh, go into another area. And this is the topic of the chosen people. Um, and in that, we'll kind of look at a bit more at how Rabbi Sachs saw the relationship between Jews and other peoples. Um, and again, we'll, we'll see a little bit the way that uh, he relied on traditional sources, the areas that he maybe deviated from some traditional sources um, and um, try to understand, again, how you, know, you start putting all of these things together, you start kind of getting a sense of, of his worldview and how it kind of impacts lots of different areas, but that ultimately you walk out with a, an approach uh, to things um, that, uh, you know, again, other schools of thought have their own approaches, but we're kind of seeing the Rabbi Sachs um, and approach that, again, resonates with a certain modern way uh, of thinking. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. A pleasure studying with all of you. Thank you all for your thank comments. Thank you. Uh, I really thank appreciate you it. Thank you very much. And uh, thank see you, you all. Thank see you. you all. Bye-bye. Well, thank you.